Um, I, I have been very blessed in studying the book of Galatians especially and I thought probably we could go through a chapter of Galatians tonight. This chapter in particular is one that helped to open my eyes very much to the to the, to, the, to the ideas that the Apostle Paul is trying to get across and help me to understand some of the misconceptions that exist among people in general and maybe many Seventh-day Adventists in particular. So I believe that if we study it together and if we can understand it, it's one way of liberating our understanding. So I'm going to ask you to go with me to Galatians chapter 3. And I want to go through this chapter piece by piece. And... Um, if, if, if we come up with an understanding of any verse that you think is faulty, I would appreciate if you'd let us know. Um, I'm very much convinced that Paul's understanding of things was different from most people. In his day and in our day. And um, I am I'm of the opinion that Adventists have not understood the place and purpose of the law, Adventists generally speaking. In 1888 when Ellen White said that um, we let the law take care of itself, one of the things she says, we, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And um, I think she was, she, was, she was grasping the emphasis that God tried to bring. In, in, through the writings of Paul. She was grasping it and she wanted to get that idea across to the church in general that the law has a place but in many cases people have misunderstood the place of the law. And Adventists today still are in that problem. I'd like us to read what Paul is saying here and see if we can understand. I am most anxious tonight that we, we follow his train of thought through the chapter. So I'd like to start with verse 1. And really the ideal thing is to start from the first chapter, first line, and go right through. But I'm going to try to just do a quick synopsis of what Paul says so far. We all know the background of the book of Galatians, right? In the book of Galatians, are the Galatians, the people in Galatia, were Christians who apparently had been introduced to the gospel by the Apostle Paul. He gave them the truth, he taught them the gospel, and after receiving the gospel, you know, it was customary in the days of Paul and the Apostles that people immediately also received the Holy Spirit. In fact, when Paul went up to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and found some believers, his first question to them was what? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And when they said that they had not, they didn't even know if there was any Holy Spirit, Paul's answer to them, to them was, unto what then were you baptized? How is it possible that you could have been baptized into Jesus and not have received the Holy Spirit? So it was customary in their days, not only for a person to receive the Holy Spirit, but to have some visible manifestation of receiving the Holy Spirit. So, these Galatians had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, Paul, something happened afterwards. The, 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 the Jews... Some Judaizing Christians, some Jews who had accepted the gospel came after Paul to Galatia and they began teaching the people that faith is not good enough. Faith alone is not good enough. You need to add the observance of the law. Otherwise you cannot be saved. And I, we, won't, we won't look at it tonight, but you could find that story, the background to it in Acts chapter 15. But they, they told the people that it was necessary to be circumcised among other things and to keep the law of Moses and Paul was very concerned for these Galatian people and so in the in the beginning of the book Paul started out by telling his credentials he said I didn't get the gospel from any man it was taught to me by Christ himself it's a very interesting book because Paul speaks in a way that I've never heard anybody else speak he says even if an angel from heaven preaches some other gospel than what I preach what what did he say let him be accursed. He says, even if an angel from heaven teaches you something different than what I taught you, let him be accursed. Now that's pretty strong. And um, it gives us the authority for saying that Paul's teachings are to be accepted and to be believed. If we really are interested in hearing what God has to say. So, chapter 3. Paul continues to talk to these people and he's very distressed about what has happened to them. 
maybe what we could do well I'm going to read because because Jim has a camera there but I was, uh, I'm going to suggest that we all follow closely because maybe I, I I would like to ask questions because I want to be sure that we are going forward together oh foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you Paul's Paul's distress at what has happened to the Galatians is so great he, it, to, to him it seems like they have been bewitched in Jamaica we would say obia or in Haiti they would say voodoo somebody has cast a spell on you who has cast a spell on you and and sometimes we believe that little differences in, in the things we believe are not that critical that's true in a certain sense but when it comes to the gospel a misunderstanding of the basis of salvation is a serious question. Amen. Paul considered it so serious that he thought nothing but an evil spell being cast on these people could explain what happened. And you'll, you'll see where he goes on to uh, emphasize how, how critical it is. He says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth crucified among you. In other words, he's saying, when I presented the gospel to you, it's as though Jesus was crucified before your very eyes. How is it that somebody could come and cast a spell on your mind to persuade, persuade you otherwise? That's his concern. Now verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now I'd like somebody to, 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 to tell me what would be your answer to that question? Okay, how would we answer on behalf of the Galatians? What do you think would be the answer? It's kind of like a rhetorical question, right? <coughs> but Linford, what would you say would be the, the, uh, the appropriate answer that Paul would expect from these people? The appropriate answer as affirmative would be that they received it by the hearing of faith. Right. In other words, he's, 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 going to he's trying to establish something here. What is he trying to establish? That they... They receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith rather than the works of the law. And therefore? The works of the law are not back to the law. The, the works of the law are not necessary to the receiving of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> which is superior? Which is a superior experience? The, the, doing the law or receiving the Spirit? Receiving the Spirit. He, he's, he's, he's almost setting them in contrast, isn't he? He says, look here, you, you, have, you have been given the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. You have been filled with the Spirit. On what basis? On the basis of what you believe, not on the basis of what you did. So his question is, how can you, having received a superior experience, now be reverting to an inferior experience? And I want you to get this understanding, because in the entire chapter, there are two things being contrasted. One of them is the law, and the other one is a promise that God gave, the promise that, which resulted in the receiving of the Spirit. Now, if, if, if I exaggerate or emphasize this, or, or overemphasize it, I want you to stop me, because we have to see that these are the two, the two antagonists. Let me put it that way. It's not a question of the law supporting the Spirit, or the Spirit supporting the law. Both things are antagonistic to each other. You understand what I'm saying? They are opposed to each other. If you, if you set out on the basis of one thing, the other thing automatically falls. That's what Paul is trying to say. And, and that's what I want to demonstrate as we go through this passage. So we need to, to, to follow very carefully. Are you so foolish, he says in verse 3, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And this question might be asked of all the brethren today who insist on going back to keeping the mosaic rituals. I mean, from the feast days to the new moon, Sabbath, or whatever it is. The question might well be asked. Well, I don't know. Maybe it couldn't apply to us as Brother Linford says, because have any of us, or as Bill said, has, have any of us received that spirit that Paul was talking about here? The question, if I asked you straight, would probably be, I'm not sure. 
Maybe. I don't think anybody would want to say, I have not received that spirit because we are Christians. But I don't think anybody would be bold enough to say, I'm certain that I have the same experience because in their time, there was a manifestation. They could say, I received the spirit. There was a manifestation. I know that that spirit, I was baptized with the spirit. So, Paul says here, you began in the spirit. Now are you to be made perfect by the flesh? What Beginning in the spirit, referring to what? Baptism. The baptism of the spirit. On the basis of faith. Now he says, are you going to be made perfect? Why does he say being made perfect? Because obviously as a Christian, you are going forward in your experience, right? You are expecting to go higher, not lower. So now you receive the spirit and then now somebody comes and say, the spirit says the spirit is not enough. You must progress on now to doing what? observing the works of the law and Paul says are you crazy you began with the spirit and now you're going to be perfected by the flesh that doesn't make sense what he's saying is that when you have when you have received the spirit what has happened to your experience or let me put it another way how does the experience of the spirit compare to the experience of the law he's saying that one is far superior when you have received the Holy Spirit you have reached a point beyond where the law could ever take you. That's what he's saying. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain. You notice what he's saying? The word, when he says, have you suffered in vain? What does that mean? What is he suggesting? That they may be lost. That they may be lost. That their entire experience might have been a waste of time. So it comes back to what I said a little earlier on. Misunderstanding the gospel is not a minor issue. Just misunderstanding the way to be saved can result in a person being lost. So, so you have many faithful people who are many faithful observers of the law who may be just as lost as a pagan because he thinks that his law keeping helps in his salvation or contributes to his salvation. Paul says, have you suffered all the things that you went through. Has it been in vain? If it be yet in vain, in other words, he's saying, is there any hope that you can still turn away from this wrong course? He goes on to emphasize this point in verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He goes back to the same question. But, you know, when I was reading through this, this verse, something struck me really hard. And I'm going to share it with you. And maybe some of us might be in the same position. Upon what basis did they receive the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit? He says, ministers the Spirit and works miracles. Upon what basis was it? Faith. Verse 5. It was on the basis of faith. It was not on the basis of the works of the law. Now, all of us have been sitting around since we became Christians waiting for the latter rain. Some of us have been working for the latter rain. Why have we never received the latter rain? Well, you know, I always believed I never received the latter rain, the gifts of the Spirit, because I was not well behaved enough. I was not good enough. I was not qualified enough. In other words, when we think of receiving the latter rain, what do we think about? We think about our behavior, our qualifications, how ready we are, how, how complete we are in terms of our behavior. That's how we think about it. I mean, if you are like me, that's the way I have always thought about it. But here Paul, Paul asks the question, and he makes me think. These people received everything that we have been waiting for since the inception of Adventism. They received it. They were raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out devils, what we anticipate to happen sometime. And Paul says, was it on the basis of what you did when he talks about the works of the law? You know, he's not, quest he's not talking about a certain aspect of the law as opposed to another aspect of the law. It's not you were, keeping the, you were focusing on the wrong aspect of the law. He just talks about the law in general. Was it by what you did is what he's saying. Was it by the works of the law or was it because you simply believed? And the obvious answer is that it was simply because of what they believed. 
That's what he's trying to say to them. God gave you the powers of the world to come. God gave you, gave you the gifts of heaven because you believed. And you made somebody come and tell you that this is not good enough. You now need to go on to observing certain rituals in order to become better. That's what he's saying. So he says in verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Of course he's, talking to, he's, he's speaking here. When he says the children of Abraham, he's speaking to people who are familiar with the, with the fact that God promised salvation through the lineage of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. There's somebody at the door. Somebody's knocking. It must be new because nobody knocks. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's go back to that verse, verse 8. We're, we're, we're going through Galatians chapter 3, brother. This verse I found interesting because it says that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. And what was the gospel that God preached to Abraham? It was the gospel of faith. It was the gospel of faith. But in essence, what does the verse say is the gospel? How was it stated? To Abraham. In thee shall all nations be blessed. In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, in that sentence, the gospel is encapsulated. And when I look at that, I say, what is the gospel here? Because when we think of the gospel, we think about faith and we think about the sacrifice of Jesus. But in essence, what is the gospel? The essence is that one man saves the world. In thee shall all nations be blessed. And of course, when he says in thee, referring to Abraham, if it was the gospel that in, in thee really refers to whom? Christ. To Christ. In Abraham, all nations would be blessed. That's the gospel. So when you, when you take the gospel and gel it down to its essential elements and you take out the frills, what it really means is that I am blessed in Christ. We are blessed in Christ. We are all blessed in one person. So the gospel is, the gospel is about the ability of one person. To save all people. And it helps us to understand the converse of the gospel. What is the bad news then? If this is the good news, what is the bad news? Maybe I should ask individual people. I don't like to do it. But in Jamaica, that's the way we always do it. You pick on people. <laughs> because Brother Linford is answering most of the questions. And the rest of us are being left behind. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to ask... Think about what we said is the good news. The good news is that all the world is blessed in a one man. Now if that is true, if that is true, Brother Leon, what would you say is the bad news if the bad news is the, oppo is the opposite of the good news? That you can be saved outside of that. Alright. <laughs> That's a reasonable answer, but it's not the one I had in mind. You want to give it a shot, Brandon? Who's the person again? The, the, the verse says, uh, uh, or according to what the verse says, we have concluded that the gospel can be expressed in this way. All the world is blessed in one man. My question is, if that is the good news, that is the gospel, and the, and the, the, the bad news is the opposite of that, what is it? All right, that's a, I would say that's the same thing expressed differently. Brother Jim, what would you say? That there's no blessing. Alright. Okay. We are devoid of blessing or that we have to work out our own. I'll tell you what I'm thinking although uh, after Linford gives his thought. Um, how about uh, we will not get a blessing from Christ. Alright. I'll tell you my thought and if you don't agree fine. My thought is that all the world is cursed in one mind. Oh. Yes. Well if you're not blessed Right, but my emphasis here is on the one man. On the one man. 
The only way one man can bless us, the only way you can get a parallel to that, the converse, is if all the world is cursed in one man. And in, in that picture, I believe, in that scenario, we get a true understanding of the gospel. If you don't understand how the world has been cursed, it's difficult to understand how Jesus can bless the entire race. One man condemns humanity. One man blesses humanity. Our relationship to salvation or condemnation depends upon our relationship to those two men. That's the point. So, it's not what you did that, that saves you. And what initially made you lost was not what you did. Adam brought the entire human race under the and we were born in a state where we were not saved. We were not born in a safe state. And it was not because of what I did, because I was born that way. I was born without the Spirit of God. I was born an alien and a stranger from God. And until the day came that I accepted Christ and was born again into the new human, human the, new Christ, the new Adam, then I was lost. So, when you think of it this way, it helps to crystallize the issues, in my mind at least, very clearly. And I could see that, I could see where my behavior is not the result of my choice. It's the result of my choice. Okay, my, my behavior initially is not the result of my choice. It's the result of where I'm born. And my, my behavior after I become a Christian is also the result of where I am born. The issue is my birth. The issue is my affiliation to one man or the other. That's what determines what I become. So, in the world today, in the Christian world, you have people fighting to change themselves, to be better, to do better, to improve themselves. They are fighting the wrong way. Because the real question is, which of these two men is my life affiliated to? Am I still affiliated to the first Adam, mean, meaning I have not been born again? Or have I been born into the second Adam, in whom all the world is blessed? Now, the, now Paul says here that God preached this gospel to Abraham. That in all the world, in, in, in one man, in him, all the world would be blessed. And that is the gospel. Verse 9 says, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And of course, faith here has to be faith directed in a certain way. It's not just faith. It's not just that I believe that there is a God. I believe the sky is blue. I believe that birds fly. It's faith directed. It's faith directed in this one man. Those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham because faith puts them in the place where Abraham's blessing is encapsulated. So those who are of faith put themselves on that side. Now the next three verses are verses that I know um, well, we have been through some of this recently. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I'm going to pass it quickly. But let's read. Verse 10. <coughs> For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now once you understand what he's saying here, it becomes clear why he's not saying you are cursed if you, if you do a certain part of the law. He's talking about the law in general. All of the law. Because what is it that brings a curse? According to the verse. What is it that brings a curse? Well, being under the law. But then he gives his reason. He says, for it is written. He gives a reason why you are cursed by being under the law. Yes, Brother Bill? Not continuing it. Not keeping them all. That's right. He says, Cursed is everyone who continueth not in what? All things. all things. All things. That is the key word. Now, a man may keep the Sabbath. And he may circumcise himself. And he may keep the feast days. And he may not kill. But in his mind, he has a little, he sees, a, he sees, a, he sees, a, he sees an attractive girl and he has a desire for her. Now he has kept, he has set out to keep the law, but has he kept all of it? And the, the, the scripture says, cursed is everyone who continues not in what? 
all. So the only possible way that he can set out in the way of the law and not be cursed is if he transgresses not one iota. The moment he transgresses in the least little thing, he ends up being cursed. That's what the Bible says. That's what Paul is quoting here. He's quoting from the Old Testament. So, to set out to be accepted on the basis of the law is the surest way for a sinner to end up with a curse. Because what happens is that no human being, none of us, has ever or will ever or can ever keep that law perfectly in order to be accepted of God. It cannot happen. What he's talking about here is people who set out to be accepted on the basis of what they do. You end up with a curse. He's not saying that as a Christian, your behavior doesn't change. He's not dealing with that yet, so don't misunderstand me. That's not what we are dealing with. Paul is looking at law keeping as the basis of acceptance with God. You see what I'm saying? If Howard and Carleen would, would say to KK, when you are a good behaved little girl, you shall be our daughter. How long would it take for KK to have parents? <coughs> Maybe never. She would never have parents. She's not accepted because of her behavior. But they want her to behave right. Oh, good. And, the, and her behavior is going to improve as they are good parents. But if that was the condition on which she would become their child, they would never, she would never just shall live by faith. So they just do not live by the law. Yes, Brandon. Got a question uh, in verse ten. Yeah. It says all things which are written in the book yes. of the law. Now God wrote the commandments not in books, but Moses wrote those extra precepts in the books. So is he talking about what was written in the books? Because it says here in the book of the law, God wrote on tables of stone. When um, we, as we read on a little further. We're going to see that he's including everything that was written in the, in, in, in the law of Moses. Which includes, because although the Ten Commandments were written on stone, they were also rewritten in, in the record of the Bible, right? They were re, re, rewritten by Moses in the book of Exodus and in the book of Deuteronomy. So, these are the books of the law as the Jews understood it. So, when Paul and Jesus speaks about the law, sometimes they even include the Psalms. But generally speaking, it refers to that that whole body of instruction that came at Mount Sinai. And, and uh, like I say, as we continue studying the chapter, you're going to see that it includes the Ten Commandments. Not specifically referring to the Ten Commandments, but including the Ten Commandments. And I want you to understand what I'm saying. I am not saying that faith in Christ makes the Ten Commandments no longer a part of the experience of the Christian. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that when a person becomes a Christian, the way of the commandments, any of them at all, is not the way of the Christian in the sense that commandment keeping cannot save a person. Commandment keeping cannot make a person acceptable to God. Commandment keeping cannot commend a person to God. And what Paul is talking about is people who believe that keeping the law is necessary for salvation. And he's saying no. And I... I, I I, I rejoice and thank God for understanding it is the truth. Commandment keeping is, is a fruit of the redeemed life. But it is not the requirement or the qualification for, for the redeemed life. And it makes a big difference. It takes the weight off people. Understand that you are a child of God by faith. And that what happens after that experience of faith is God's business, not ours. The, the tree bears the appropriate fruit. Jesus says, A good tree cannot bear evil fruit, and neither can an evil fruit, evil tree bear good fruit. It's the nature of the tree that produces a fruit. But the problem is that these people and many Christians set out to produce a fruit in order to prove that they are Christians or in order to, 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 to come into the favor of God. They set out to produce the fruit. It's neither the way nor is it possible. Jesus says it's not possible. So, he says the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So he tells you why the law is not of faith. Because the law itself says, in Leviticus 
18 and verse 5, God says, The man who does these things shall live in them. Let's read it quickly. Go over to Leviticus 18 and verse 8. See where Paul is quoting from. 18, 1, 8. I think I give you the wrong verse there. It's verse 5. Now this is so important because there are so many Christians who quote, quote from the Old Testament here and they use these verses but I don't think they use them the right way. Look what God says in verse 4. This is one of the things that most people would hold up as wonderful. You shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. It all sounds very good. God says it. God says, if you do this, you will live. See how Paul takes it on. And that is why some people reject Paul. Because they say, no, Paul is going too far. But see what Paul says. The law is not of faith. But the man that does them shall live in them. And he's saying, you have two options. You have faith or you have the way of doing. He says, the law is not the way of faith. The law is the way of doing. The law says, do this. And you will live. But he says the just do not live that way. The just live how? The just shall live by faith. So he's showing us that the way of the law is the way of works. It's the way of doing. And that is not the way of faith. So you can understand why in 1888 there was such a great debate about the law in Galatians. Because Adventists were very happy to say that the law in Galatians was dealing with the ceremonial law because statements like these were hard for Adventists to understand and they're still hard today. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that until today when, the, when Moses is read there's a veil over their eyes and the veil is caused by not understanding what Paul is saying. Most Adventists, I've only ever met one Adventist, well I didn't even meet him, I, I got a tip from one person from one of these ministries who understands what it means to be under the law. One person in all the years I've been an Adventist. And you say, who says he's right? Well, it's a, if you don't understand what it means to be under the law, you can't make sense of all the things Paul says. When you understand what it means by being, what it means to be under the law, everything goes click, click, click. And you can begin to understand the gospel. But if you don't, some time ago, 3 ABN, last year or the year before, when they had this Ten Commandments day, 3 ABN, they put out a book called The Ten Commandments Twice Removed. Yeah. Right. But if you, go, if you go to that book and you read what um, Danny Shelton and, and this lady who wrote it, Shelley Quinn, if you look at what they say, they say the key to understanding all Paul's references to the law is to understand that sometimes he's talking about the ceremonial law and sometimes he's talking about the moral law. It's the old Adventist interpretation that has been there for decades upon decades. If you accept that and you try to read what Paul says, you get thoroughly confused. There are some passages that Paul writes, you can't understand when Paul says, but we are delivered from the law. When he says, but, but after that faith, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But after that faith, faith has come, you are no longer under the schoolmaster. When he says the law was not made for a righteous person, you can't understand those passages. So they try to split and divide and say, sometimes he's talking about the ceremonial law, sometimes the moral law. But it's not true. He's not talking about, he's not distinguishing. He's simply talking about whether we are saved by observance of law. Any law! Or whether we are saved by faith. No law can save anybody. Be it ever so pure and holy. Somebody says, well what happened is that we, we need to understand the greater principle of the law. You must love. And so they tell you, love your enemies. And they think that is the gospel. Man, I tell you it's harder to love your enemy than to refrain from, from, from stealing from him. So the old commandment is easier because the old commandment says thou shalt not steal. The new one says thou shalt love. If you think that this is a gospel to tell somebody, thou shalt love, you're giving him something harder to do. That's not the gospel. It's still the same basis of rule. Many of the Sunday keeping people say, you Adventists, you, 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 you set up the law. Don't you know the law is done away with? Why not under the law? And then they go and make laws themselves that are 
equally restrictive and even harder than the Ten Commandments. Some of them say you have to cover your head. Some of them say you have to wear white. Some of them say you have to fast twice in a month. They set rules for their people equally restrictive and then they think that they are, they are not under the law because they reject the ten. That's not the point at all. The point is no law, no behavior is the qualification of our salvation. Faith is a qualification. That is a point that Paul is making. And if you see, let's go on. So it says, Christ hath redeemed us, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I won't go back in, go in, in, into that in depth. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And I tell you, as we await the latter rain, and as we talk about the coming, pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we need to remember this verse. Amen. Pray God we don't forget it. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, the only thing that prevents you from receiving this promise of the Spirit is the limitations of our faith. It's not because we have to wait until someday when we reach a certain standard of behavior. I don't know if I'll be considered a heretic to say that. But I'm telling you, based on what the Bible says, we don't receive the promise of the Spirit because we have attained to a certain place. I have seen and felt the strain and the struggle and the impotence of my relationship with God because I just cannot believe that one like me will ever be worthy. You know what? At 56, I'm ready to, to lay down and say, whatever is left, Lord, is hopeless because my best days are behind me. The strongest was when I became a Christian at 22. Between 22 and maybe 40, I was in my peak. I mean, I could do things and I could stand the cold. I could go out and spend days out in the bush fasting. I had a zeal. I was ready to take on the world. I give it my best shot today when I go to pray to God. I think, Lord, Will I ever find the strength and the discipline to go back to those days of fighting and fighting and even all that fighting? I never saw one little drop of the latter rain. If it's depending on what David is going to become, will I ever be among those who will see the latter rain? Maybe God is strengthening me in a better place because my faith and my understanding are better. And the Bible says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? By faith. So maybe my chances are better today than they ever were. Because I've stopped going by the way of my effort and my works. And I'm, I'm going by the way of faith. Yes, sure. I have a desire that is as strong as ever to reach other people. I have a desire that is as strong as ever to overcome and to stop committing sin. But I don't think it is relevant to what God has to give me. That is the fruit of the Spirit of God at work in me. I have a stronger desire now. As I understand the Gospel, man, I want to go everywhere I can. I, I'm praying every day, God, open doors, because I don't think I will ever have the means to go on satellite TV. Open doors that I can share what you're putting in my mouth. My, my desire is just as strong. My desire to stop committing sin is just as strong, but I don't feel anymore that God is waiting on me to to reach that certain infinite peak before he can bless me with his spirit. Because I, I, I believe it is for me when I believe. That's what the Bible says. You cannot point to any place in the Bible where it was not simply by faith. Peter preaching to Cornelius, instantly the Holy Spirit fell on them. On the day of Pentecost they preached, instantly the Holy Spirit came down. There never is any place in the Bible where they say, you're not ready yet. You understand the gospel in its primary sense. But now you must go on and become more pure and more holy. You must work to a higher standard before God can bless you with His Spirit. Then what explanation do we have today that we don't receive that Bill, as I was saying, as I was saying, you cannot receive anything unless you believe, unless you accept it. Were you baptized expecting to receive the Holy Spirit? Did you expect? I never expected. I'm just beginning to expect. 
And even in my expectation, like I said at the camp meeting, there are doubts crawling about in the back of my mind. Because the baggage is not easy to dispel. You know what the apostles did? Jesus put his hands on them and blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And then on Pentecost, he gave them some visible evidence to say that, I have come into you. They didn't go out there and ask, How holy am I? They didn't go out there and ask, Am I qualified? The next sick person that Peter said he saw, he said, In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He knew the power was in him, right? And the other people that were baptized, the other people that accepted the, the, the message, they saw the power in the apostles. The apostles laid their hands on them. Did they have any doubt? I mean, the thief on the spot was converted and he came and Peter laid his hand on his head instantly. No question about what is the level of your holiness. God gave the Holy Spirit in answer to faith, but they did believe in a way that we don't believe. We have a lot of things that, uh, that are hampering our faith. But what I'm saying is, when we start to go in the way of faith, where our approach is right, when we start to approach in the way of faith, when we start to, to fight the fight of faith and to examine the foundation of our faith and what is wrong with our faith and why it is we are approaching the right way, and that is a beginning. When we are taking the way of works and behavior and measuring ourselves against a standard of behavior, it's the wrong approach. That's what I'm saying. And that has no end. Because there will never be a day. You know, Ellen White says, the closer we come to Christ, what will happen? The more unworthy and impure we appear in our own eyes. But I believe that I must be perfect before I can receive the gift, right? So the closer I come to Christ, how do I look in my own eyes? More imperfect. So when will I ever believe that I am fit? The very thing I'm searching for becomes the greatest stumbling block. It's an impossibility. I will never ever believe because I will never ever believe I'm qualified if I go by that road. If I don't take another road, I can't believe. It says, when you ask and you doubt, James says, when you ask and you doubt, let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. So the very approach is, a, is guaranteed to produce failure. Now, here is a really interesting part, beginning in verse 15, and here's where I want us to, to, to follow very closely. Paul says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. I'm speaking in, 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 in human terms. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, a eh, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now he mentions two things. When he says a man's covenant, as we read a little further, we see that he maybe he's speaking about something that we call the last will and testament. And it says, when people make an agreement, once, when people have written a will, let's use the, the, the idea of a will, because I understand that this is a very legitimate understanding of the word covenant. When people have made a will, once it is confirmed, he says, nobody can disannul, meaning what? Make it. Nobody can cancel it. And nobody can add anything to it. And is that, is that basically correct? Right. I mean, right. many times you have heard of people dying and they leave their fortune, millions of dollars to the cats. <laughs> and the relatives get infuriated and they may go to court and contest it. But once it is the last will, it is a testament of the person. It has been confirmed and the person dies. That's it. It cannot be changed. Now, this was true apparently in Paul's day, and that's what he's saying. He says, brethren, you, know, you understand the, word, the idea of a covenant. Once it has been established and confirmed, even though it is only a man's covenant we're talking about, you can't cancel it and you can't add anything to it. Now, is he talking about a man's covenant? No, he's talking about God's covenant, right? But he's using man's covenant and saying this is how it works in man's covenant. And he's saying basically that that principle applies in God's covenant. Now he goes in verse 16. He says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed. He saith not, he did not say, and to seeds. 
as though he were speaking about many seeds. I'm paraphrasing here. But as of one, as though he's speaking about one seed, and to thy seed, which is Christ. What he's saying is that when God made this promise to Abraham and his seed singular, who was he talking about? Christ. Christ. So the seed that he made the promise to was Christ. So get that point established in our minds. And I should have had the board set up so I could write it down so you don't forget. But let's just imaginarily write it here. The promise was made to Abraham and Christ. I should say, the promise was made to Christ in Abraham, or Abraham in Christ, however you want to put it. Now, he goes on to con continue his argument. And you know where that promise was made. You could find it in Genesis 22, where God said to Abraham, because you have, it says, it says a little earlier on, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. In another place it says that Abraham, God said to Abraham, I have made this covenant with you and with your seed, that in your seed shall all nations be blessed. So God made that covenant to Abraham and his son and his seed. Now he says, verse 17, And this I say, now here's his main point, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, when did that happen? The council. council the council of peace, brother, brother Leon says. All right, let's see when it was made. I'm going to ask you to go with me. Hold this page and go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. I know it's a bit complicated, but Paul is like that. But when you, ch you follow his reasoning through, there's a great blessing. Hebrews 6, and I wanted to read something here for me. I want to read from verse... 16. In fact, let me read from verse 13 so we get the full context. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein, God willingly, more abundantly, to show unto the ears of promise, the immutability of his promise, did what? Confirmed it how? By an oath. Now what we read over in Galatians is that once there is a covenant made, and what happens to it? Once it is confirmed, nobody can add anything to it or take anything away from it. Now here, God made a promise to Abraham and did what? Confirmed it with an oath. So there we have the confirmation of the promise. The promise was confirmed when God made that promise to Abraham. And swear to Abraham. You can find it back there in Genesis 22 where God says, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, that because you have done this thing, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So God confirmed the oath to Ab confirmed the promise to Abraham with an oath. Now you see Paul's reasoning. Paul says, Once a promise, a testament, a covenant has been confirmed. With a, confirmed, Nobody can add anything to it. And nobody can take anything from it. So according to God's promise and God's confirmed covenant, how are people blessed? In Christ. In Christ. In the seed of Abraham. That is God's appointed way. And God confirmed this covenant by an oath. He could not swear by any greater, so he swore by himself. And he says, I swear by myself that I'm going to bless the world in your seed. Therefore, brothers and sisters, nothing can be added to that. And nothing can be taken from it. So anybody tells me that I'm blessed by keeping the commandments is a liar. Anybody tells me that I'm blessed by observing any rituals is a liar. Because God's confirmed oath is that all people are to be blessed in the seed of Abraham, which is Christ. That's what Paul is saying. So, 
let's continue let's go back to Galatians let's go back to verse 17 and let's follow his reasoning here now and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect remember what he says earlier on he's referring back to it he says once the covenant is confirmed nobody can disannul it and nobody can add anything to it so he says the promise was made of God in Christ and the law which was 430 years after cannot cancel the promise neither can it add anything to the promise that's what he said when a covenant is confirmed it cannot cancel it cannot be cancelled it cannot be added to now he says 430 years after what happened 430 years after God made this covenant with Abraham Sinai. Mount Sinai thank you brother Bill Mount Sinai and that's where we come to your question Brandon Mount Sinai was a place where the law was given. Not just the ceremonial laws, but the entire law. The Ten Commandments inclusive. The Ten Commandments came on Mount Sinai. That's the first place God formally expressed a, a set of rules. Well, the second place. According to what Paul says, the first time God gave a formal law was in the garden. When he says, don't eat from the tree. The second time God formally gave mankind a law was at Mount Sinai. So there was one law in the garden and there was a set of laws at Mount Sinai. But in between, God expressed the covenant to Abraham, right? He not only expressed and told Abraham, in your seed I'm going to bless the world, but he says, I take an oath that it shall be so. And he confirmed it with an oath. And once it is confirmed, nobody can add anything to it. So what Paul is saying, you foolish people, don't tell me that you're going to add law keeping to your salvation in Christ. Don't tell me that having begun with faith in Christ, you are now going to go to the way of the law as a means of salvation. Because you can't add anything to the covenant. It was established and confirmed by God with an oath. Yes, Brother Lynn. Um, let me just ask you to clarify something. Yeah. Joseph would not commit adultery because he said it was a sin against God. And Cain knew that it was a sin to kill his brother. So, just harmonize that how, how there were, were was sin they transgressed somehow a law yet it was not far away. um maybe I could read from Romans in answer to that question Romans chapter chapter 2 Um, Romans chapter 2 and verse 12 and this is probably I mean we could explore this verse but I think this verse says it in a way that might be can shed some light on it verse 12 says for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law so he, 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 say, he refers to a class of people who sin without the law and exactly what he means might be debatable. But I believe, I believe that there always was a universal awareness of certain things as being wrong. One of the things that was not, they were not aware of was, for example, you find where the, the, the woman had earrings, Jacob's wives. They stole the gods of Laban and when they were coming back to Bethel, Jacob said, take out the earrings out your ears because we are going back to where I met God. Certain things that became later considered to be wrong was not a part of their cultural concept of right and wrong. There were no clearly laid out laws. But there was an awareness of certain things that were morally unacceptable, right? And I think it might have either been passed on. There, there are some things that you know right away in any society. It's not right for me to go and kill Brother Leon without some cause. And you don't need a law. You don't need a rule to tell you that. There's a universal sense of what is acceptable in moral beings. That even in the most primitive societies, you normally don't find stealing or murder or adultery acceptable. And not because there's a formal law. It's like, it's like a law of conscience then. And I believe that this existed very much before the Ten Commandments were formally given. 
So that's maybe the best answer I could give to that question. Um, would you expect that maybe God explained the Ten Commandments to Adam? I mean, it, it, it's, it's possible. And I'm not going to say it wasn't so, but one thing I know is that in the writings of Paul, it is not considered. So, so in, 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 under, in studying the writings of Paul, he does not express it that way. And I think to understand his point, we have to leave it that way. You know, so. Anyway, he, he says that, um, that the law was 430 years after the promise was confirmed. So it could not add anything to the promise and it could not cancel the promise. Now in verse 18, you see where he says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's saying that in order to inherit, in order to inherit the blessing of Abraham, it cannot be on the basis of, what the, of the law. It has to be on the basis of God's promise. It has to be on the basis of faith in what God says. So in verse 19 he asks a question, which is the most natural question that a person will have, especially a Jew or somebody who believes in, 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 in the system of law. And in verse 19 he says, you know, somebody saying, whoa, wait a minute, Paul, what are you saying? Wasn't the law given by God himself? Yes, Brother Bill. I can't quote or remember where things come from, but I remember all of my saying that when God gave the law uh, to man, uh, the angels were surprised that there was a code of laws. They had always lived by them, but they didn't know that they were written down or that there was a code of law. So it seems that uh, in a life controlled by the Spirit of God, the law that was expressed in commandments was simply the right thing to do. Yes. And I and I think Adam could have had, I mean, he was created perfect, and he communed with God, and he communed with angels, and he would have had an understanding of those things that were clear to his heart yes. when he walked with God. I believe and that's I a good And I think that Adam would have expressed those things to his generation. Mm -hmm. So even if we don't have a record of law written down as such, we have an understanding that those beings who walked with God had that understanding. And that understanding would be passed down, albeit maybe not perfectly understood as generations went on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one way to look at it and recognize that that they weren't without law. I mean, if you understood the law of love, if you understood that single law, if you turned away from that principle of life, would anybody need to tell you when you transgress that principle? I mean, how could I, understanding what love is, feel free to take what belongs to you or to kill you? Or to, or, to, or to commit adultery, or whatever it is, you know, or to covet. I mean, automatically, as you are saying, this is something that they would instinctively know is and wrong. In fact, Ellen White tells us that the, the conscience is the voice of God to the soul, and that it is the conscience through which God speaks to us and directs us. So, these things that we talk about as universal are understand most. In any society, by a man in his conscience, not by necessarily what's written down. I think that's why the scriptures can say, "Those who had not the law were a law unto themselves," and that when they began to act, their conscience directed what they did, and so they were controlled by law that they never knew. Uh, so I, I can understand both sides, where uh, we would expect the law written down, and yet God from the very beginning directed a society without a law written down, there had to be some understanding both in society and in the conscience of man what a law was. So but, but, yes, but, uh, for and then Brandon. I was going to say, wouldn't Joseph have an understanding of that from um, things being passed down because obviously they didn't write things down at that time and God gave Adam and Eve the marriage covenant 
told them how they were to be towards each other and to be fruitful and multiply. So obviously they passed that down. So wouldn't Joseph of course. have that knowledge? Of course. Brian Dunn. Uh, one thing, I, I had <coughs> two things here. One is a question and the other one is a statement. This statement just goes with what you're saying. It's actually still in Romans chapter 2 if you go into 13 and 14. It says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel. So it seems that goes along with our Bill saying here, and also what you were saying. My thing is, I go to Psalms, and the whole book of uh, the whole chapter of 119 are people who love God's law, and they meditate upon it day and night. So, I mean, it says, it's Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. I mean, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. And there's, oh, don't worry. There's a, it says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I will meditate in your precepts and have respect unto your ways. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Blessed are thou, O Lord, teach me your statutes. I mean, it just sounds like earlier, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you said something about uh, you're not blessed for keeping the commandments. But here, these people say they are. All right. not, not, I'm not saying as far as for salvation, but these people delight in this law, it seems to me, regardless of whether they're going to be saved or not. Um, I'll let Jim share something and then I'll respond. Well, Go ahead, Jim. Actually, the response is in the next couple of verses, mm -hmm. because it is obvious what it's talking about here is that for the Goyim, the, the worldlings, the, the Gentiles, <coughs> from their nature, well, how did they get this nature since they didn't keep the law? They got this nature through the rebirth experience. And that's talking, that's verse 15 where it says, they show the work of the Torah, the doers of the Torah, as it is written upon their hearts. How do you get that experience? That is the new birth experience. So these are people that are keeping the law. Is it the Ten Commandment law? Of course it is. But is it also the law of love? Of course it is. Because the Ten Commandments was a unique writing of the law to the Israelites alone. Now it has been um, brought on down to us, but it is in the exact same format as any other treaty, preamble and ten precepts. And that that's not the greatest way of expressing the law. Jesus Christ told us the greatest way is to love God, be committed and be a part of God. So what, what's going on here in Romans, is, I think, is talking about this change of nature that comes when the law is written on your heart. And that is the new birth experience. And Paul is defending this uh, fact in his converts. So I don't see what you're saying is out of harmony. All right. As a matter of fact, it is a deeper harmony. It's the new covenant that he's talking about. It's not the old one that curses us when we try to keep it. It's the new one we live in Christ. And we don't try to keep it. He keeps it in us. Thank you, Brother Jim. That's Sister Caroline. Uh, uh, my turn to speak, but let me let you go ahead. It just says here that the law of God existed before creation of man, or else Adam could not have sinned. 
Okay, right. So that's what Paul says, that there was a law that says thou shalt not eat of the tree. There was that law. But back to, to Brandon's question. The Bible says that God blessed the Sabbath day. And then the Bible says that only in the seed are we blessed. Well, only in the seed or in Christ are we blessed. What does that make the Sabbath? If God blesses the Sabbath and the only blessing is in Christ, what does that make the Sabbath? He blessed it through Christ. He blessed it through Christ. But a little more than that I am thinking. I am thinking that the Sabbath only has meaning if it brings us into that experience with Christ. There is no blessing in the day itself. That blessing is in the experience that we find with Christ on that day. The blessing is in Christ. The Sabbath was an opportunity to get closer to Christ. Now when David talks about being blessed through the law, is it the law or that the law directs him to Christ? Because the Bible says the law, we're going to come to that verse, the law was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us to Christ. The only way meditating on the law can bless anybody is if that meditation brings that person to Christ. Not by, not by bringing you into conformity to a certain behavior. It's bringing you in conformity. It's bringing you to a person, into a relationship with that person. That's the blessing in the law. That's what God designed it for. And when David talks about being blessed by meditating on the law and so forth and so forth, it was because in that meditation he was being drawn closer to the author of the law. And, and that, that, that harmonizes both covenants and puts the law in its rightful place. That is its purpose. See? Um... Let's go back to Galatians 3 and, 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 and continue because in Galatians I think Paul ties it together pretty well and he says there's a little verse in there that I'm not sure I understand but the thought I get out of it man it's a nice little thought. Let's go back to verse 19. He says wherefore then serve at the law since we are blessed in the seed and I want you to follow his reasoning now. If, if we are blessed in the seed of Abraham that is in Christ then nothing else saves us. So he's saying, what's the purpose of the law? If we're already saved in Christ, why did God give a law? Because you don't need the law then. Because you already have salvation. That's what he's saying, right? Follow his reasoning. And he says, wherefore then serve at the law? It was added. Notice the word added. It was added. It was, it was, it was, it was an appendage that was hooked on to the plan of salvation because of transgressions till the seed should come the word till signifies what? it's, limit, it's of limited duration God never intended the system of law that, that method of serving God to last forever it was a limited system that God set in place till the seed should come the promised seed in whom the whole world was blessed that is the one but until he came until he came, God put a system in place because of transgressions. People were still sinning. Sin was still taking place. God put a system in place to deal with that situation until the seed should come who was the answer, the real answer to all sin. The law never was. It was a stopgap measure. The system of law was a stopgap. And in other places he simply says, and that purpose was, how would you know sin if you didn't have? Exactly, yes. No, and, and, and more than that, it also restrained bad behavior. Until Rebecca yeah. can understand the principles of why she needs to do certain things, her mother and father have to put her under law. They say, sit and keep still. Don't talk. Because there has to be some kind of order. Even if she can't understand, why can't I run about and make noise? What on earth are they talking about? Even though she doesn't understand She's placed under law because of her childish state. God did that with the Jews. Until we came to the place where we were mature enough to be sons, we were treated like servants. So the law served that purpose. Yes, Brandon? I want, I want you to know I do agree with you. I'm on the same page as you are. Okay, great, great. Some things that concern me. Um, in, the, in the book, The uh, Great Controversy, how come, why did God give Sister White so much light on Satan, make him void God. Um, I want to save that question for another study because it's a different study. It's a different question. I can, I'm, only, I'm, I'm on Paul's page. I have to get on Sister White's page to deal with that. And I don't think it's going to be something simple. Okay? 
So you'll see with me if I don't uh, respond um, so adequately to that question. So it says, it was given till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained. Look what he says next. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now the next verse. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. How, I don't know how to make sense of that statement. Brother Linford, do you have any thought on it? I have a little thought. But I want to hear what you have to say because why does that drop in in the middle of the passage? What does it mean? Why does he bring that in? It says the law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. I think it has something to do with, with the whole passage, but it kind of just stands in isolation if you don't understand what it's saying. Anybody? Let me tell you what I think. When there's a mediator, what does it mean? There are two parties. And what does it say about both parties? There are odds. There are odds. So the very fact that there was a mediator meant what? There's more than one. There's two parties. God was at odds with the people. So Paul is saying the very fact when the old covenant came, the fact that there had to be a mediator, it was ordained by angels, it meant that there was there was there was a difference between God and His people. God is one. So, later on, when you come down a little further, you see, you see what, what He's really saying is that there's no barrier between God and His people. But there was under the Old Covenant. Yeah, in fact, if you look at that in the context, now mediator is not a mediator one, but God is one, God is one party, then He's implying by that statement there was another party. Yes. And the whole context of what He's talking about was God's people and the law. Yes. So the implication there is God and the people. Yes. So it seems to me. So the next verse says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Since you have the promises on one side and the law on one side, is the law against the promises of God? Promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. If it were possible, God would have done it. But it's impossible. So God had to find another way. What he is after is to give us righteousness. And the law could not do it. So he found another way. And that way is the way of the seed. That way is the way of Christ. That is the way of righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. Let it be said and established and never forgotten. Christ is our righteousness. Not that he gives righteousness. That's not the point. He does, but that's not the point. He is my righteousness. In Him I have obtained righteousness. The law never could, never did, never will give righteousness. Or else God would have ordained it that way. But the scripture has concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Christ Jesus might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But look at verse 25. But after that faith is come what? We are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now this is where if you don't understand what it means to be under the law. You get confused. Because the people who reject the Sabbath say you are no longer under the law. The law is obsolete. It no longer has any meaning or any relevance because we are no longer under the law. That's not what the passage is saying. It says, first of all, we were kept under the law. What does it mean to be under the law? This is what so many people misunderstand. What does it mean to be under the law? We're under the law of the land right now. That's right. In other words, when he says under the law, what he means is to be controlled to be governed by to be to be under obligation to the system that governs you is a system of law this is what it means so the, the system that that brings about your behavior is law you know that Zachariah wouldn't be sitting there if he were not under law he would not he'd prefer to be running about or doing something else right Zach <laughs> but the law of his parents keeps him in that spot he's under law 
Now Linford can do that to Zachariah and Josiah and Rebecca, but he cannot do that to Sister Rose, right? He may make suggestions, but he cannot keep her in her seat by law. She is controlled by a different law than it, these children are controlled by. So she's not under law. She's not under that law. She's not under Linford's law. Now God put the Jews under law because they were children and he says, you must, you must, you must, you must. And they obeyed whether they liked it or not. And if they didn't, there were penalties. They were under law. Their behavior was based on what the rule said. Not what the heart said. Not what the conscience said. It was the rule that controlled them. They were under law because they were children and God put them there until faith should come. Then he says, now that faith has come, you'll have Christ. You're no longer under that law. You're now operating from the basis of a new nature, not rules. Yes, Brother Lynn. Uh, there, there are people that have to do community service and go out and pick up trash. Uh, you, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Maybe they don't do it in Jamaica. But here they have community service that a, law, a judge says you have to give so much time for community service. Okay, I've heard of it. So there's a law that required to do that. And then there are other people who do it because they want to. Yes. Um, anyway, I see that as a difference. They're, even though they're doing the same thing, one wants to do it. It's, they're doing it because they want to. Another one is doing it because they have no other choice. This is uh, a law that requires them to do it. I'm going to go even a step further. In both cases that you, you, you cited there, both are responding to law. <coughs> the same law, but the motive is different. That's the difference that you are... You are, you are I, I didn't catch that difference. Right. Well, well, what I'm saying, that the scenario, scenario that you present is that both people are doing the same thing but some are doing it because they want to do it. Okay, maybe, 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 maybe that wasn't implied in what you said. Maybe that's what I'm seeing there rather than what you said. Yeah, in what he's referring to is the fact that there are people, for instance, who, because they love their community, mm -hmm. love to go out and pick up the trash along the road. They do it voluntarily. Okay. In our judicial system, a judge for a minor infraction may say to an individual, you have to go out and do 10 hours of picking up trash. Okay, so in, in, in the one, one does it for love of the country. For other, they do it whether they like it or not because it's either that or go to jail. What about the third one? The third one who picks up trash like, um, like a woodpecker picks up worms. Like a... Like a a crow, a vulture picks up dead meat. Why does he do it? This is nature. This is nature. It's not for love of the country why a vulture picks up dead meat. He doesn't want to see a clean place. It's because his nature just impels him to do it. And that's a third group, right? And I'm saying, where are we? Are we in the second group or the third group? Do we pick up trash because we love the country, or we love the system, or we love God, or we love his law? Or do we do it because now, like God does, why does God do good? Because that's He's not capable of doing otherwise. It's something in him that impels him to do good, right? It's his nature. Now when we are made partakers of the divine nature, does something similar happen to us and we instinctively desire to do good? Instinctively. Or is it that we just think, we just, we just recognize that good is better and now we begin to respond to the laws. Or is it a nature thing? Now that is where there, there's a question that sometimes we have a conflict over this. Not everybody agrees with what I'm trying to suggest here. But I believe when you look at the Bible, there's strong reason to believe that what happens is that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And like the song says, there's a little song we sing in Jamaica, a little chorus, the children sing. I don't know if you sing it here, but it says, The things I used to do, I will do them no more. It's a great change since I've been born. Now, is that because the things I used to do, I choose not to do them anymore, or, which is true, but or is it even stronger? The things I used to do, I do them no more because... It's just not in me to do it anymore. I have no desire to do it anymore. Everything in me hates what I used to do and now loves what I didn't used to do. 
Is it a change of nature or is it a change of your thought processes, of your perspective, or is it a change that comes from inside? Well, you have to, the ultimate application of that question in my mind is what happened to Satan. Because yes. before the fall, can you say he did it instinctively? Can you say that he did it because he loved it and he knew it was right? And what changed in him that caused him now no longer to do it instinctively or to do it no longer to do it by desire? And I can see some questions being raised that are hard to answer, but I won't press that. But to me, the ultimate answer is the first sin. I think so. And that's, the ultimate that, challenge. That, that's a good illustration. And I think another one is Jesus. When the, the Bible says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Does it mean that he memorized the law? Or does it mean that it was written in every fiber of his being to do good? You know, so I think those are things we can consider. We'll just go, rapidly go through the last few verses because I think my time is just about up. And it goes down. I have another tape, but we have eight minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay within the parameters of the one tape, Jim. I don't want to overdo things. Now it says in verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That's the purpose of the law. Psalm 119 inclusive. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Like, you know, you know, a schoolmaster becomes obsolete. Sometimes you know more than the schoolmaster. You are no longer governed or guided by a schoolmaster. When you have graduated from high school, you are out. From college, you are out. So you no longer need a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And that's it. How do we become children of God? By faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. I love that phrase and it does well for us to consider what it means. What does it mean to have put on Christ? Is that a, a figurative position, a theoretical position or is it a literal position? What does it mean to put on Christ? Through faith. I said at the camp meeting and I, I say again, we don't understand the power of faith. I've heard it said people quote James where James says faith without works is dead and what they mean is you say you have faith, go and work. Faith without works is dead. It is not that you lack works. It is that you lack faith. Dead faith is not faith. Living faith works. Living faith works. When we have faith, works are not a problem. You don't need to consider works when you have faith. What is the problem is a lack of faith. When I first started to dig into this question of righteousness by faith. Man, it hit me really hard what it means to be a part of Christ. And you know that it reached some people really in that way that, that, that you know, Brother Howard asked a question up in Colorado. He said, if, 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 if Christ, if I have become a part of Christ, who am I? If I'm a part of his body. And somebody said, Christ. In the context in which he was speaking, he's not saying, I am Christ. He's saying, I'm a part of his body. I'm a part of his existence. I consider myself. Who do, who do I see myself as being? I see myself as being a part of him. And when the person said Christ, he agreed. And it caused a big thing, you know, because, you know, you don't say you're Christ. And he didn't mean it that way. And the person didn't mean it that way either. But I'm going to tell you that, that particular concept, I found to be a great help. That particular concept. Because you can, I can go through life as David Clayton. I've done it all my life. I was David Clayton. When I think of David Clayton, I am ashamed. When I think of David Clayton, I'm insecure. When I think of David Clayton, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. And I never will be anything. And w as long as I have this concept of myself, you are who you understand yourself to be. You are who you believe yourself to be. As long as that is my concept of myself, I just keep digging a deeper and deeper hole. I must see myself as God sees me and has made me. He has put me into His Son 
I'm a part of that existence and the life of Christ is in me. And the existence of Christ is my reality. The Bible says I'm a joint ear with Jesus Christ. The Bible says God has given to us eternal life. Is it mine? Yes. Then where is it? And this life is in His Son. The only way I have that life is if I'm a part of that Son. So the Bible says we are members of His body. We are the body of Christ. And we are members of that body. It talks about the hand and the nose and the eye. We don't have the same talents, but we're all a part of the same body. One life flows through all. It is the life of Christ, part of that great whole that is called the second Adam. That is who we are. And the reason why we come short of the mark is because our feeble faith just refuses to hold to that reality. Sometimes we grab it a little bit and we're walking on the cloud and nothing can stand in our way. But too often we forget. Too often we lose our focus because that's the way of our human nature. And I believe the fight of faith is a fight to hold to the truth of where God has put us in Christ. When you know yourself to be who you are, when you know yourself to be a son of God, when you know yourself to be entitled to every benefit that belongs to Christ, entitled, no reservation, freedom to go into the very presence of God without inhibition, Man, you are somebody. And nothing can ever make you behave different when you know it to be the truth. And that's why the fight of faith is so critical. The fight to believe the truth. So he says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs. You have inherited that promise that God made to Abraham. What can we say when we consider these things? But we can echo the st sentiment of Paul, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Yes. We are immersed and raised as a part of himself. Hallelujah. May God help us that we might, we might keep this in the forefront of our minds. And when we lose sight of it, rapidly find our place again. Well, that's where we end for tonight.